Uh, my name is uh, Andrei Svirov. I work for Yandex. Uh, does anybody know what Yandex is? <laughs> oh, okay. For those who doesn't know, I'll tell you. Uh, Yandex is a Russian search engine. It's uh, the most popular Russian search engine. Uh, according to Live Internet Statistics, in July 2013, we had 62% of Russian, Russian search traffic. And also we operate in Kazakhstan, in Belarus, in uh, where else? In Ukraine, in yeah, and in Turkey. So in Yandex, I I'm the head of Cloud Technology Development Service, and so yeah, I build infrastructure for Yandex. Uh, here at this conference, uh, I'm the guy that do the talking. Uh, I'll be only talking and showing you some stupid pictures, and also. Uh, a bit later at 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m., yeah, we'll be having a workshop where my colleague, Vladimir, here he is, he'll show you like hands-on experience about our technologies, you can try them out, you can, you know, upload some code to the cloud and write some application in JavaScript, in Node.js, and use our BAM methodology, all the kind of stuff. So, before I begin, telling you about these technologies, a bit of history. So, infrastructure. The word infrastructure, the meaning of the word infrastructure, it doesn't, it, it didn't really change for like last 10 or so years. It still means a mess. And business usually starts to do its business on top of infrastructure. So, uh, an easy, an easy induction yields a great result. Businesses build their businesses on top of a mess. That's not really good. I explain why and how did all how did it all happen? So usually companies start with a tiny number of servers. So basically they have like one server for MySQL, one server for some kind of Nginx on Apache, something like that. And that's it, it works. Our ten users come every day, check out our front page, it's great. But then the load grows, the user base grows, and our expectations grows too, so we have to buy more servers. And now we have different kind of machines. We have slow and old servers, we have new and fast servers, and we have a heterogeneous machine park. And it, it's really bad, and it gets even worse when you don't have a way to track your hardware. So, in infrastructure, one thing is bad, diversity. It's really bad when, you, when your machine park is heterogeneous. Uh, another thing is that your perfect piece of software, which you just deployed in your old servers, uh, suddenly it became not so very ultimately perfect. And suddenly it got broken because there's some kind of bug. And after you fix it back, you have to ship your product to users again. And to do that, you need some kind of uh, deployment, uh, some kind of shipping technology. And you know, I've seen many, many times that people ship the products using some kind of air scene, which just copying the binaries to the servers, and that's it, right? It works, you just restart your server, and suddenly you have a new version of your product deployed to your servers. Uh, but you can't really do that easily because you have all the kind of different servers now. You have the old servers, you have database servers, new database servers, old web servers, front-end servers, cache servers, any kind of servers. So you have to do some complicated and sophisticated stuff like using some, I don't know, sophisticated Perl script for that. And I'll tell you what, that's not deployment. And more importantly, our thing is not for deployment too, it's for copying files around. So now you've got some random software because you just lost something while copying it with our thing. Uh, and you got random machines because you lost track of these machines and now suddenly something got broken and the only option you have now is to randomly press buttons to your laptop trying to fix something hoping it will, it will fix something because you just you don't really know what's broken because you forgot about another stuff another important thing is which is monitoring uh, and really I even have two slides for that yeah, really monitoring monitoring is really important and you can't really do monitoring when you don't have track of your hardware and you can't really do monitoring, you can't really collect metrics when you don't have uh, 
some kind of deterministic deployment stuff deployment scheme because if you don't know which software works where you can't really monitor it right that's just not possible so monitoring is control and without control you can't really do something above just copying files around and trying to you know, pray to God that it will work for some uh, some prolonged time so one last subtle thing about this messy infrastructure like the dark days of infrastructure is that uh, you know, developers, one day they finish their Java handbooks and suddenly the code starts to run 146% faster. And that's a good thing, right? When code runs faster, it's good. But I say yes and no. Because, yeah, from some point of view, faster code means the users get served faster, they're more satisfied, they see that, you know, your company grows and you're really, really committed to making your software good. But from the other hand, that's not a good thing. Because suddenly all of your servers, they're just standing there and data centers doing nothing, just warming up the air. Because, you know, the code fast, uh, runs faster now. So suddenly this making the code runs faster stuff made you lose money because you're just spending them on hardware you don't need. And on the contrary, the, the other thing about that, about this non-homogeneous non uh, infrastructure is that you can't really handle bursts. So for example, when your company, your startup, or whatever, or like some of you, some, some of your product, got for example tweeted or for some some cool guy, or for example, uh, it got posted on D or something like that, Reddit, for example, uh, you got a traffic burst. And when you when you when you have this traffic burst, you have really tiny window of opportunity to react to that traffic burst. And if you don't have, uh, if, if you don't have the infrastructure to do that. You just start throwing five or threes to your users and they are not really satisfied with that, right? They just go away and start tweeting that, ah, this doesn't work, screw it. So what I want to say about this infrastructure stuff is that uniformity is power. When your infrastructure is uniform, uh, then, and only then, you can handle all these different situations with ease. And I'm not like telling you some revelation here about that. It, it's, it's really a known thing in the world and a lot of smart people spend really good time thinking about it and trying to come up with some kind of a solution. And one of these solutions is called the cloud. So, like, uh, the cloud in my world, and like in, in my terms, the cloud is some kind of a homogeneous and consequently modular infrastructure platform with deterministic and well-tested deployment procedures and with uh, complete test coverage. And it's not like that uh, specific to computers. These three points, the modularity, the deterministic uh, usage patterns, like when you know how your software, how your piece of engineering stuff works, and the test coverage is common in engineering. For example, some of you have cars, right? And your car follows the same principles. Your car is modular. So for example, if your radio broke, break, breaks down, you don't replace your car, right? You just replace the radio. And for example, if you going straight and you rotate your steering wheel clockwise, your car turns right. If your car doesn't top turn right, your car is a completely broken, you have to throw it out. Because it have to, if it turn right, right, it's a car. And your car probably won't turn left because your car is well tested. And this is uh, very, very important for engineering to be well tested because otherwise your car just becomes a killing machine, like a suicide bullet. And you're not a vendor to go into suicide booth, right? So, uh, before starting our platform, and two years ago, we started about these three points, and we thought, hey, there is a piece of software in the computer world which really phonetically follows the three points. And that piece of software is an operating system. It's modular, it's well-tested, and it's deterministic. If, if you do something time and time again in the operating system, it yields the same results. So otherwise, you just can't base anything on that operating system. So we thought about it for a bit, and we decided, hell, let's build a cloud operating system. So the cloud, like an operating system. Uh, you probably know how an operating system works, right? Uh, and what kinds of operating system are there? Uh, if you check out Wikipedia, it says that there are different kinds of operating systems. There are microkernel operating systems, 
micro kernel operating systems, monolithic kernel operating systems, and so on. But the, the common thing about this operating system stuff is that every operating system has a kernel. Uh, and the kernel, like the main part of the system, is some piece of code which runs in a privileged mode of CPU operations. It has full control of the hardware and can do anything with the computer. And another part in the operating system is a user space. User space is uh, your code, which runs in unprivileged mode of operation. It is controlled by the kernel, and it can use, use the services that are provided by the kernel. So uh, the kernel itself is basically composed of three things. The things are device drivers, basically tiny little programs which provide the kernel an interface to interact with the different hardware like disks, network cards, sound, video, all that kind of stuff. It's, uh, another thing is uh, resource control, resource managers, basically that's uh, parts of the kernel that uh, schedule and control what share of CPU, disks, I.O., network, and all the shared resources that are provided to your user space code, which, which, which part of the shared resources your user space code can use. And the last part is uh, is security, basically. That's the thing that uh, doesn't allow one piece of user space code, like one program, to, to tamper with another user space code, like to steal some account information, all that kind of stuff. So this is three, like three main parts of every operating system kernel. So now imagine that instead of a single computer, we have thousands of computers. And instead of, for example, a couple of disks, we have a petabyte size storage. And instead of uh, one network card or two network cards, you have a network topology spanning the whole country. And it suddenly started to sound like some kind of rocket science, but it's not. It's the same thing. We just need some kind of cloud drivers, right? Some kind of software that provides provide our cloud kernel with interface to access that sets petabyte size storage. It's the same driver, the same thing. It just allows us to access the storage, right? We need some kind of resource control still, because we have these thousands of CPU cores, and we need to somehow schedule our software to run on these thousands of CPU cores. And we need to, to schedule them right in fair fashion. And there's still security, because now your programs have uh, really a lot of opportunity to tamper with other programs. And for example, that's one thing when you run a cloud inside a company, like a private cloud, then your code can be trusted. But when you don't, and your code can be trusted, it comes from third-party source, you have to really, you want to play safe in that case. So we thought about that, and we tried to build a platform. And because we really liked it, and we liked the experience we had while building this platform, we decided to call it cocaine, because cocaine is addictive, right? That's a warning sign. Uh, so let's talk about this platform. And no, I'm the talking guy, so uh, I can talk and I can answer questions, but I won't show anything like, uh, I won't show you some you know, hands-on experience like the, the guy with the Xbox, with the Kinect for that. You can see that on our workshop later. So, our platform. Uh, everything in our platform is a service. Uh, when we started, we thought about you know, different approaches like service-oriented models, all that kind of stuff, like interconnecting with the service bus, message passing, whatever stuff. And we thought it's really complicated, and for example, if I try to explain about this uh, message passing infrastructure oriented stuff, that would like, take me a whole day. So instead of doing this complicated stuff, we decided that everything in our platform is a service, everything. And one thing, which is not everything, is a service controller, it's service locator. So, for example, services. Services can be storages. So, services can be logging. Services can be geolocation. Services can be security auditing stuff. So, basically, there are tens of services in the platform, in, and applications can use these services. And actually, applications are services too, in a sense that applications expose the same interface that the services do. The only thing different from the services itself for the applications is that. They can't access the kernel directly. They just can't suddenly start writing directly to the storage, for example. Or they can't have suddenly decided to use all the bandwidth available to a node and spend it all to download some stuff from the internet, like a torrent file, something like that. 
uh, the apps has to have to go through the arbitration process. And this arbitration process is done with a thing called service locator. Uh, service locator is a special service which is first of all responsible for starting and stopping the services. So when you add a new service, for example, your, uh, your cloud platform installation starts to support, for example, search. To, to, do, to, to allow other applications to search, you have to start a new service. So that's what service locator do. It starts and stops and controls the services, the other services. And more importantly, the service locator is responsible for <coughs> dynamic service discovery. So uh, you probably know about other, uh, other message passing mechanisms like Corpa, Thrift, Zero Q, the kind of stuff, you probably know about that. So every kind of these RPC-based uh, technologies, they use IDLs, interface definition language. So, for example, if you have some piece of software, some service running on a server somewhere in the internet or the cloud, and this service exposes some uh, functionality, like for example, storage, you can, you can, with the storage you can read, you can write, you can find some data, right? So, if you want to make use of that service, uh, you have to get some uh, something called ideal first. It's a description of its interface. So, basically, it says that this service has three methods. You can read data, provided the key. You can write data, provided the key, and the data to write. And you can, for example, search for data, provided the number of keys. So instead of using the same approach with IDLs, we decided to drop IDLs completely. Uh, the only thing you need to know before accessing a service is its name. So for example, if you want to access storage in our platform, the only thing you have to know is the name of the storage. For example, there's a storage called default storage. Suddenly. So after that, you go to the service locator, which is done automatically by the software, and you download the interface description from the locator. Uh, the funny thing here is that if your code uses a storage service, for example, any kind of storage, uh, any kind of other service, uh, and for example, the platform changes the underlying storage under the service, for example, First, it was using MongoDB for the storage, but because MongoDB is bad, you start using, for example, Cassandra. If you switch this underlying storage under the service, you don't have to rewrite your code at all. You don't have to change a single line of your code. Because the methods are the same. It's still read, it's still write, and still find. And because of that, the storage swap doesn't, doesn't do anything with the code. It still can read the SQL write and SQL find, so you don't need any other like you don't need to use some kind of other user space library. You don't have to use some kind of to switch drivers, for example. You don't need to switch uh, the access library in Python or like in, uh, in the language you use. Uh, and this, this said, uh, we decided that people probably, people will probably want to change the underlying uh, the implementation of the services. So we thought that implementing them as plugins would be a good idea. So for example, let's take a logging service, right? This is very simple stuff, you just, you can log some message and that's all. But you probably know that there are like a million ways to do that in computer world. There are a million loggers, there are like log stash, syslog, car syslog, uh, Windows even something, I don't know how it's called, really. Windows even, even service, stuff like that. So. If, for example, you use this logging, logging machinery from your application directly, then if you use syslog, you have to use the, sys, uh, the, the system calls for syslogging. If you use log stash, you have to send your log messages via UDP or zero queue. If you use Windows logging stuff, you have to use the Windows APIs, right? But if our developers use our logging service, they don't need to know about that. They don't need to think about that, actually. They just use the login service, they use the default login service name, and then they start logging stuff. And it goes somewhere, and it's kept safe there, and now our operation guys can look up for the log messages. And if our operation guy decided that log stash is now the bad thing, and some super logging system is a good thing now, they just swap the plugins, that's all. Applications continue to work, they continue to log the messages, they don't even know about that something was changed in the platform. And um, that's actually a great thing. And talking about services, uh, I want to talk in 
about one service in particular. Service is storage. Because uh, when you build a platform, storage is a very important thing. Because if you don't have storage, you don't have a place to keep your applications for the starters, right? So storage is important. And when we're talking about storage, people usually think that ah, that's uh, you know that, that's the thing uh, which is sharding data, keeping it in multiple servers, and all the kind of stuff. Yeah, that's it. that's the storage. But uh, when we're talking about the cloud and the guys who develop applications for the cloud, they can't really think about this specific stuff. They don't really want to know how to shard data. They don't really want to know how many replicas are there. They don't really want to know how to protect the data and how do you make it available. They just want to put something in there in the cloud and just get safe here. And when I want my data back, I, I want it to be there, right? That's a good thing about storage. So uh, keeping that in mind, we thought that Oh, okay, probably we'll do like that, like I told you before. We just implement a couple of methods, and we won't do any configuration about that. I won't allow user to configure anything about the storage. And when we started to do that, people were like, what? Well, wait a second here, guys. Uh, I, want to, I want to change numbers and timeouts. I am the smart guy here. I know that when I do this search request, uh, it, it will take me 26 seconds, so I want my timeout to be 27. Or, yeah, hey, I, I know that it should be kept in uh, 42 copies. That's really important for you guys. 42 copies, not less. 41, everything will be broken. Uh, there was a lot of uh, confrontation about that, but still, we did it our way. We did it without any configuration. Suddenly, it just works. You put your data in the storage, it sits there. You want your data back, we get it back to you. And when we were implementing that, we actually implemented our own storage. It's called Elliptics. It's open source. Uh, there is a community about this Elliptic stuff. So uh, after the presentation, if anyone is interested about the storage, I can throw you a couple of links so you can check it out. So this storage, when we are planning this storage, we're keeping one important thing in mind. Uh, except the sharding, except this uh, copying, all the kind of stuff. One important thing is that we can't lose data because we made promises. We said, you want to be able to configure anything and because of that, your data will be safe. So now we have this promise to keep. Data has to be safe. And when we're talking about this data safety stuff, uh, we, people usually think about connectivity loss, meshing goes down, and our disks got broken, something like that. Yeah, that's common. Uh, disks get broken every day. Machines go down every day, but one important thing about uh, this uh, this emergency stuff is that, for example, sometimes there is a tornado, and sometimes a cat walks into a transformator, and the whole data center goes down. Every machine, every disk is offline, and when that happens, we still have to keep your data safe, and we still want it to be available, and that was some of the principles we kept in mind when we designed our storage. So right now, uh, the chance of your data to be lost in the storage in our data centers is like zero, 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 nine zeros and one. So we calculated it. Uh, that's very cool because now we think that probably, yeah, we'll keep our promises. Uh, except apart from the storage stuff, another important service which, was to, which I want to talk about is the node service. Uh, the node service is actually that service that is responsible for the user applications. So uh, apart from this service, if, if there will be no that kind of service, then this cloud platform will be kind of useless. You know, you could read data, you can log stuff, you can use geolocation, you can fetch URLs from the internet, you can use caches, but you can't actually write any user code. That's like a operating system with, with only a kernel without any user space. So this node service is responsible for applications. When you want to upload a new application, when you want to start an application or stop a new application or like collect some statistics about the application, that's the thing that this service does. Uh, for example, when a new application is getting uploaded to the platform, it's kind of the same thing as when you download something on your phone or to your computer from the internet. We just save this something like binary, like an tar, gz, torball. We save it to our storage. 
Uh, and when the operation guys click on the start button, we take this binary, this application from the storage, we distribute it across our platform, across every node. Uh, we enable our scheduling mechanics to actually determine the number of CPU shares, IO shares, network shares, and this, every kind of that stuff that your application is allowed to use. Uh, we configure the location for that application, the service locator, so that the application can use the cloud services. And then the node service starts to actually monitor the health and the safety of the application so that we can do the self cleaning stuff. So the application have, uh, is, is, is made of three things in our platform. One thing is the application itself. It's like an archive with your data, with your binary, with your configuration files, every kind of stuff. You just put everything you want in this tarball, the container stuff. You just keep it like you want. We don't care. The an another stuff is the execution profile. It's basically the, uh, like the numbers, the timeouts, the limits, the queue limit, worker pool limit, all the kind of limits, all the kind of timeouts, and the application manifest. The application manifest is a little tiny JSON file when, where the, the only required thing is the name of the binary, like the entry point for your application. It can be a bash script, it can be a binary, a compiled code, or C++ or C code, it can be a Python script, it can be a Ruby script, or some Java jar file, anything like that. Uh, and in order to run this archive safely, in order to, uh, like the thing to do to, to, for us to, to, to don't care about how we run application, and the thing that allowed us to say that things, like to say to our developers that uh, you can put anything you want, like your dependencies, your binaries, your libraries, you just put anything in this archive, we don't care. Uh, if you want to put a Trojan force into that, yeah, go forward, yeah, put a Trojan force, we don't care. It's because we use containerization. Uh, containerization, probably heard about that, uh, the Linux containers, or Virtuoso virtualization solutions. Uh, it's like uh, lightweight virtualization. Uh, there, are, there are like heavyweight virtualization solutions. Oh, tea party. So uh, the heavyweight virtualization solutions like Zen or KVM, they're good for that task too, but they are very too heavy. For example, to spin up a virtual machine from from a from a, not a uh, hibernation, hibernation stuff, hibernation state to spin up it like from the cold state takes a couple of seconds. Uh, that's okay if you do that like once a day, but our platform uses uh, the worker approach, worker pool approach. So we have uh, a special mechanics to balance the request flows and to split them, split the user requests. So. Because of that, we launched uh, several instances of each application, several like hundreds instances of each applications, and we stop them too because when the, the the request flow goes down, we don't want to keep your application running because it does nothing and it's just just a waste of resources. So, because of that, we spin off multiple virtual machines, and if we used uh, Xen or KVM here, it would be just too long to to spin spin up these virtual machines. And because of that, we try to use containerization. It works very well. Uh, there, uh, there's a product called Docker, maybe you heard about it. It's a Californian company called uh, Dot Cloud. They developed this product called Docker. Uh, it's kind of, uh, imagine, uh, imagine the docking container on the ship, right? The container where you just put your stuff inside it, you close this container, and you just say, to some ship group, ship it there to some another continent. And after the ship is going to another continent, you take this container, don't open it, you put it on the train and ship it further. Then you put, take this container, put it on the truck and ship it further. Um, the funny thing about the separation of concerns, our job is to take a container without knowing what's inside it and without knowing how this inside stuff is supposed to function, and just to ship it to the users. And the developer's job is to put things inside it in such a way that this stuff works. So we tried to use this Docker stuff and it turned out pretty well because actually it happened that developers, they don't want to be uh, tampered with. 
developers don't want to be said that you have to put this library here and you want to get the config file here and your binary has to call init.init.idonalysol in, in, uh, or init.bi. They want to do anything they want with the software because they're smart guys, right? They just write this complicated stuff with Python, Haskell, whatever, and they just want it to be run like they think it's supposed to be run. So we said, yeah, okay, that's okay. That's okay with us. Just put it into a container, upload it to our storage, uh, and we'll do everything after that. We'll do the, the writing stuff. So this containerization is, uh, is enabled by two things in the Linux kernel. One thing is namespacing. Namespacing means that when we start your container, your container is, uh, is run in a separate namespaces. There are different kind of namespaces. For example, there is a PID namespace, which means that your application has PID number one, like in it. It doesn't see any other process in the system. There is a file system namespace and mount namespace, which means that uh, when your program is run, it sees like it's running from the root. It's like ch root. Uh, and it sees that there is uh, no other mounted containers on the system. So it's like a clean system for a clean file system. There's not network the namespace, which means that we can set up a special, uh, not like special, we can set up uh, interfaces, network interfaces for each application, different interfaces. So uh, when an application in the container uses network, it uses, via, it uses it via a special designated interface for that application. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we can shape traffic. And another thing is that set of namespaces is C groups. C groups is another part of Linux kernel which is responsible for resource control. So C groups allows us first to audit your application, to see how much traffic you spent, to see how much disk I/O you spent, number of CPU shares you used, how much memory you're using right now, and what kind of memory. Like, do you use a swap? Maybe this shared memory. Maybe it's not shared memory. Maybe it's like memory mapped files. And another thing, except for auditing, is limiting. So, for example, we can say that this application is not allowed to use any more than 112 gigabytes of megabytes of memory, and that's, that that restrictions allow us to randomly control the way the application is working. For example, if we know for sure that each copy, each instance of the application won't use more than 512 megabytes of memory, then we can calculate that. And think that with that load, for example, 100 requests per second, and that amount of memory, and that amount of CPU shares, and that amount of disk I/O, the application can handle 100 requests per second. So when our monitoring solutions, when our monitoring subsystem of the cloud sees that the load grows, then we can calculate it even more. We can think, oh, it's it will be 200 requests per second with that rate of uh, acceleration in five minutes. So we can pre-spawn more instances of your application and, ready, and we will be ready for the burst. And we, when we see that the request flow goes down, then we can think, oh, we don't need these instances anymore. We just can shut it down and free resources for another application, something like that. And to do that, to do this calculation right, we had to route all the traffic through our routing system and to balance it with our load balancing. And when people usually talk about the load balancing and cloud in, in the same sentence, it usually means they're talking about HTTP load balancing, like using a proxy or using, or using some Nginx and something like that. But we thought that uh, using only HTTP is kind of limiting and actually right now there is a new HTTP 2.0 standard coming up so using just HTTP is not really wise for a new stuff. So instead of using uh, some kind of uh, protocol, like strict protocol, our platform operates in binary streams. We don't want to know what kind of information you pump through your applications. For us, it's just some binary stream. You can put HTTP 1.1 into it. You can put HTTP 2.0. You can put video, raw audio. You can put, I don't know, he exposing the probability detection rates, anything in it. So we just balance these streams. And to, to, to balance them right, uh, we decided to implement our own load balancing solution. Uh, so usually in cloud, in open cloud platforms, like for example, OpenShift or Cloud Foundry, 
or open stake, they don't really don't don't really care about balancing because there are a lot of products on the market already. Because, for example, this HTTP proxy everyone uses, uh, but because we just suddenly dropped the HTTP and we implemented our own uh, streaming protocol to stream these binary streams, we had to implement a new a new load balancing solution. And for that, we we picked a uh, technology called IPVS. Anybody heard about IPVS? No? Uh, IPVS is uh, implemented in Linux kernel for like 30 years, or 20 years, I think. Uh, it's a kernel built-in load balancer. It's not something that we've written. It's there for, for like a decade already. And, and because it's implemented in the kernel, it's really fast. We don't need to do the user space kernel switches to balance traffic. Traffic goes through the kernel, it never goes up to the user space until it arrives at the destination host. And because of that, we, we can achieve really high throughput and we can, more importantly, achieve a very low latency. And low latency is very important when you do some video stuff, for example. Uh, and because people who are developing this IPVS stuff, they developed it for like a couple of years already, like 10, 10 years already, 20 years already. Uh, they had a lot of time to implement it, uh, some interesting stuff in it. For example, because we use this IPVS stuff, we have 10 ways to balance the traffic, including uh, some normal stuff like route dropping or list connection stuff. We can, for example, balance your traffic in that way that, not, uh, that every node has less than some percentage of the traffic from all the users. And all the different, all other stuff, like, uh, like uh, uh, some other methods of balancing traffic. And because we use IPVS, we can measure the, the, we can not only measure the number of packets coming in and out, or like a traffic coming in and out, we can actually measure, for example, the number of TCP fragmented packets which are coming in and out of the platform. And because we have such granularity of monitoring, we can really use that numbers to calculate the, the exact amount of uh, resources and the exact amount of instances of the, uh, of the applications that we need to start to spin up to handle the load, to handle the load uh, in a good way without throwing five or three to the users. Uh, so that's actually what we have now. But we have some plans for the future. And actually, when we started to develop that stuff two years ago, uh, it wasn't like we sat on the round table and made the brainstorming, and suddenly we realized that, yeah, that's the perfect way to do a platform, just do it exactly like that, and we had a plan for two years. Two years ago, it was like diving into a murky WordPress without a flashlight. You're just randomly pressing buttons on the computer, trying to think, oh, yeah, probably that's a platform. Oh, no, it's not a platform. Let's try again. So uh, right now, we have a plan. and. More importantly, this platform is open source now. So if it was closed, like a proprietary for Yandex, we could do some random crazy stuff because nobody sees, right? But now it's open source. And because it's open source, we have some responsibility before, uh, for our community. So we have a couple of plans now, uh, a couple of interesting plans for the cloud platform. So the number one request for the platform right now is that please implement billing. Now, when you do a platform for the company, you don't usually implement billing, right? Because you can't bill your own developers. That would be cool, but we just can't, we can't do that. So one plan number one is to implement billing. And to implement billing, we have to implement uh, some kind of tokens. Because right now, for example, if you try to use a platform, you'll realize that every application can use any service. And any application can actually, for example, any application can access every part of the storage. There's no control about what part of storage application uses. Uh, and that's fine until you do applications, still run applications from other guys outside the company. So you need some kind of tokenization mechanics to uh, grant people rights to use different parts of storage or to grant people rights to different services or to grant people ability to use, this, use some kind of privileged mode of operation in uh, some kind of a service. So 
that's for tokens. And another thing that we want to do is to actually uh, write a computation. That's a really great thing. Uh, we realized that when you try to open source a product, that's a good thing that you have a documentation first. So now we're coming up with a good documentation. We have some documentation now, and on a workshop later on, <coughs> probably they will see you some kind of documentation, show you some kind of documentation, right? No? We'll show you definitely something. Yeah, okay. So, and I think actually that's it. That's what I wanted, that's all what I wanted to tell about the platform.